Good afternoon. This is the Kyoto Congress Ancillary Meeting, the Rule of Law and International Arbitration Mediation. This session is co-hosted by the Ministry of Justice of Japan, the Japan Federation of Bar Associations, and the, the, and the Japan Association of Arbitrators. My name is Idei Naoki, Vice President of the Japan International Dispute Resolution Center, JDRC, serving as an MC and a moderator. Due to the pandemic situation, this event is conducted on a so-called hybrid uh, webinar mode. Speakers of these sessions are here at, at the Kyoto International uh, Conference Center, and there are uh, uh, a few uh, audience, uh, actual audience here, but most of the audience are participating online. Okay. Uh, Opening remark, let me introduce Mr. Ueda Hidetomo, Vice President of the Japan Federation of Bar Associations. Mr. Ueda, please. My name is Hidetomo Ueda, a Vice President of the Japan Federation of Bar Associations, JFBA. Firstly, I would like to thank you all very much for participating in this ancillary meeting, the rule of law and international arbitration and mediation. It is truly a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity at the Kyoto Congress, the United, States, United Nations largest international council in the field of crime prevention and criminal justice which is being held here in Japan for the first time in approximately 50 years. As the world becomes more and more globalized at an increasingly rapid pace, it is essential to create a fair and equal dispute resolution procedures, not only in the field of criminal justice, but also in the field of civil and commercial dispute in order to realize a society where the rule of law is upheld. In particular, in the field of cross-border commercial transactions, the importance of using ADRs has become widely accepted, and international arbitration and international mediation are becoming the global standard for such dispute resolution. In Japan, the public and the private sectors have been coordinating to promote international arbitration. And in 2018, Japan's first international arbitration and ADR dedicated hearing facility, the Japan International Dispute Resolution Center, JDRC Osaka, was opened. And the JDRC Tokyo was also opened last March, which boasts world class facilities. Collaborating with the Ministry of Justice and the Japan Association of Arbitrators, the JFBA is also involved in the management of the JDRC. And in order to make international arbitration in Japan easier for people around the world to use, the JFBA is also focusing on examining legal structures for international arbitration and the training of legal professionals adapted at handling international arbitration. I have been informed that today, report will be made regarding international arbitration and mediation in Japan, as well as the measures being taken to promote the use of such dispute resolution method, followed by a discussion among the participants. I would like to conclude my remarks by conveying my wish that this ancillary meeting will be of great significance for all participants. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Weda. We will have uh, three keynote speeches, and uh, thereafter, uh, to the extent time allows, uh, we will have question and answer session. Online audience can give questions by using a chat function. 
the secretariat will choose and assort them and forward them to the moderator, and the moderator will read the questions. I wish, I, I wish to uh, uh, spare uh, as much time as possible for the question and answer session, so I must cordially ask the speakers to keep each speech within the allotted time, 15 minutes. Okay, the first speaker is Professor Dogauchi Masato, Professor of Waseda University Law School and Executive Director of the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association, which is a representative commercial arbitration institu institution in Japan. Professor Dogauchi, please. The title of his presentation is exactly the rule of law and international arbitration mediation. Dogauchi Sensei, uh, thank you, Ide Sensei, for your kind introduction. Uh, my presentation is on the rule of law and international arbitration and mediation. It is my great honor to be here to make a presentation in this session. Today, I'd like to stress that international arbitration and mediation is one of the uh, indispensable systems to promote and maintain the rules of, rule of law in international business society. People in many countries have achieved the rule of law after long and fierce struggles for many years. In these countries, people are all bound by laws which are enacted by a majority vote in a parliament, whose members are selected by equal voting of the people themselves. The court system in such countries are formed and proceedings there are conducted in accordance with such enacted laws. People there enjoy sustainable development under the rule of law. However, uh, we have to admit that uh, there are still many other countries where the rule of law has not yet been secured. This is why the goal 16.3 of the SDGs is to promote the rule of law and ensure equal access to justice for all. This goal is one of the main topics in this Kyoto Congress. It should be noted that the goal 16.3 includes some additional words which I intentionally omitted in my previous quotation. The complete wording is to promote the rule of law at the national and international levels and ensure equal access to justice for all. We have to look straight at the fact that the rule of law has not yet been achieved at the international level. There are many issues to be, to be discussed regarding international rule of law, especially from the viewpoint of public international law. But since I am a professor of private international law, so I'm going to focus on a specific issue that is the need for and significance of arbitration and mediation for the benefit of international trade and investment, even between companies who, uh, within whose countries the rule of law has been completely achieved at a domestic level. National court systems are independent from uh, their uh, counterparts. Thus, the judges of country A are in principle uh, nationals of country A. Court proceedings of country A are conducted in the language of country A and are in accordance with the procedural law of country A. And finally, the judgment of country B 
is not necessarily recognized and enforced in country A. In short, the world judicial system is just an aggregation of such mutually independent national judicial systems. From a viewpoint of foreigners and foreign companies, it is not justifiable at all for them to be subject to the judgments rendered under the national judicial system to which they have no democratic participation. In addition, such a national judicial system can be disadvantageous for foreigners in terms of nationality of judges, language, and procedural law. Thus, the rule of law achieved at the national level does not necessarily sustain the rule of law at the international level. The international society is still in chaos in terms of judicial system. In light of this, it was natural for international merchants to manage to create their own dispute resolution system. Historically, it is said that the origin of business arbitration was born in a course of Mediterranean trade in the Middle Age. Nowadays, arbitration plays a very important role in the resolution of international business disputes because it ensures a level playing field for both parties. When the amount of disputed claim is high enough, there are usually three arbitrators. In such cases, each party appoints one arbitrator and these two party appointed arbitrators agree on the third arbitrator. It is usually observed in practice that the nationality of each party appointed arbitrator is the same as the nationality of the appoint appointing party. And the nationality of the third arbitrator is different from that of any of the party appointed arbitrator. Thus, the arbitral tribunal is uh, completely international. And the arbitral proceedings are conducted in a party agreed language, language pursuant to the party agreed rules. On top of that, I'd like to touch upon uh, mediation a little. Mediation has not been widely used in business dispute resolutions in comparison with arbitration. But recently, thanks to Singapore Convention on Mediation of 2018, which gives enforceability to written agreements resulting from mediation, International mediation is now more and more widely used as a tool to resolve international business disputes. It is fair to say that international mediation plays an increasingly important role to promote amicable settlement outside the national court systems. My conclusion is very simple. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to say that international arbitration and mediation fill gaps existed in the aggregation of national judicial systems and perform the function of resolution of international business disputes. In view of that, international arbitration and mediation are indispensable to promote the rule of law at the international level. Thank you for your attention. And incidentally, uh, you can review or see my PowerPoint slides after the, this session. 
on the website of the Ministry of Justice. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Dogauchi. Uh, Professor Dogauchi's present presentation has given us perspective from the viewpoint of history as well as from the transnational viewpoint and how today's subject matter, arbitration and mediation, is related to the rule of law, filling the gap between national judicial systems. With this sound overview, the microphone is turned over to the next speaker, Ms. Ohara Yoshimi of Nagashima Ono and Tsunematsu. She is a practicing attorney, particularly active in the field of international commercial arbitration. She is also governing board member of International Council for Commercial Arbitration, ICCA, and executive director of Japan Association of Arbitrators. Ms. Ohara, please, uh, her tight, her, the presentation of her, of her, the title of her presentation is International Arbitration in Japan. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, I can't pronounce, the f this is French. Uh, where do we come from? Where are we? Where are we? Uh, what are we? Where are we going? Am I correct? So please. Thank you, Mr. Ide. Um, I'm sorry to give you a challenging task at the outset. Um, well, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizer of this event and each and every member of the staff who make this event possible. Um, I can see the enormous effort has been exhausted to make this happen. And it is my great honor and privilege to be given the opportunity to present Japan's initiatives and firm commitment to present Japanese initiatives uh, to, to promote international arbitration in Japan and in the region, to enhance rule of law, and to promote, um, to provide viable option to the arbitration community in Japan and in the region. In 2012, at the ICA Congress in Singapore, the Honorable Chief Justice of Singapore, Sundaresh Menon, called the age of um, international arbitration as golden age. He highlighted the quantitative and qualitative rise of international arbitration globally and particularly in Asia. The rise of international arbitration in Asia is well demonstrated in the Queen Mary University of London 2018 International Arbitration Survey. The survey results shows that like Singapore and Hong Kong, they, become, they have become very popular um, seat of arbitration. In fact, um, Singapore was ranked as the third preferred seat of arbitration and Hong Kong was the fourth um, following London and Paris. Likewise, when it comes to international arbitration institutions, SIAC was ranked as the third preferred arbitration institution and HKIAC was uh, ranked as fourth following ICC and LCIA. And if you take a look at the case road, for example, the number of new cases handled by SIC increased by almost 200% in 10 years. And HKIC has consistently received over 400 new cases every year since 2014. And KCAB, located in Seoul, has more than 30% increase in arbitration cases in seven years. Then what about Japan? So Japan has built a good foundation of international arbitration at the early days. 
1961, Japan um, became the member state of New York Convention. In 1996, we opened up the market to foreign practitioners practicing in Japan. In 2003, we have introduced Arbitration Act consistent with Unsuitable Model Law of 1985. But if you take a look at the statistics of international arbitration in Japan, to give the positive light, it remained to be greenfield. So looking at the JCA case number between 2012 and 2016, case, the number of new filings remained to be approximately around 20. And looking at the ICC cases seated in Japan, um, between the same period, the number of cases seated in Japan per year is below five. And this is um, the data uh, up to 2016. But even afterwards, essentially, the, the statistics remain the same. You have seen the remarkable growth of international arbitration in Asia a minute ago at the outset. It reflects the significant growth of Asian economy. However, proliferation of international arbitration in Asia is not purely organic. A strong government mandate and support for international arbitration and business community and legal community closely work together with the government played a critical role in attracting international arbitration to jurisdictions such as Hong Kong and Singapore. So in 2018, the Japanese government recognized the importance of promotion of international arbitration in Japan. Why? As Professor Dogauchi just mentioned, elaborated, international arbitration is essential legal infrastructure in the globalized economy. International arbitration supports cross-border investment into and outside of Japan. And more fundamentally, international arbitration promotes the rule of law and Japan being the sophisticated civil law jurisdiction in the region should have a role to play. Then how are we going to promote international arbitration in Japan? There are five key um, strategies. First, increase awareness of the advantage of international arbitration in cross-border dispute resolution, as just Professor Dogauchi explained. Number two, Strengthen the legal infrastructure to support international arbitration. Number three, the builder capacity through training or providing workshops. Number four, build a well-equipped facility that can provide full services of a physical venue of conduct of hearings. And number five, promotion of Japan as the seat of international arbitration. Building sophisticated infrastructure is one thing, and being recognized to have such infrastructure as such is another thing. For a country like Japan, where mother tongue is not English, there must be continuous efforts to publicize the sophisticated legal infrastructure to become widely recognized in the global arbitration community. So, based on this 2018 um, government policy, the same year, in 2018, JRDRC Osaka was opened up. Ministry of Justice kindly allow us to use the facility, their facility in Osaka. In 2020, um, last year, JRDRC Tokyo was launched at Toranomon, the center of Tokyo. The same year, we have expanded the capacity of registered foreign lawyers in the field of international arbitration that I will explain in more detail. 
And this year, there's another um, effort is in pipeline. We are now upgrading the legal infrastructure to make it more arbitration friendly that I will explain in more detail. So I'm going to explain three initiatives. The two first two initiatives has been already implemented. The third one is in pipeline. The first initiative is to open up the hearing facility in Osaka and Tokyo. I hope you take a moment to take a look at this JDR, JIDRC website. You can see beautiful um, state-of-the-art hearing facility on this website. So this JIDRC offers hearing venue and also it supports virtual hearing and it is equipped with simultaneous interpretation booth. International arbitration in this region um, often parties require interpretation support. With this support, the party can make their case fully. So this kind of facility is quite important um, to have hearing in this region. And in fact, JIDRC is not just a hearing facility, the hardware, but also it provides the um, capacity building services assistance so it opened up, I guess, June last year, and within six months, they offered 16 training and conferences. And they offer e-training, and also they put together virtual hearing protocol so that arbitrators or practitioners who, have, who haven't done virtual hearing can rely on such protocol. The second initiative that has been already implemented is to increase capacity using the, the workforce of registered foreign lawyers in Japan. So registered foreign lawyers are lawyers primarily practicing the law of their home jurisdiction in Japan. So it's in addition to fly in and fly out foreign lawyers. Now we recognize um, them as precious resources for international arbitration practice in Japan. So we want to capitalize the workforce. How to do that? Two items. First, we made it easier for them to register as registered foreign lawyer. So it, they have to have three year practice um, before they can apply for the registered um, foreign lawyer, but out of three years, they have to practice in their home jurisdiction only one year. That will facilitate the uh, registration of uh, registered foreign lawyers in Japan. And second, we have expanded their capacity, which means they are now um, able to serve as counsel in arbitration which has been considered to be domestic arbitration. So even if the arbitration was conducted between Japanese parties, if there's some foreign element, those foreign, registered foreign lawyers can serve as counsel. Now I'm going to touch on the, the third initiative, which is in pipeline. So we are now trying to upgrade the legal infrastructure to make it more arbitration friendly. There are three items. First, we are going to amend Arbitration Act so that party can utilize entry measures more easily in Japan. What by that I mean, now Arbitration Act is going to, new Arbitration Act after the amendment is now going to specify the requirements of interim measures, and now interim measures can be enforceable in Japan. Interim measures is getting very, very important in the setting of international arbitration when our international arbitration is getting taking more time and more complicated. And number two, it, it relates to court practice. Now, parties 
can go to either Tokyo District Court or Osaka District Court to, it, when the case relates to arbitration. That means that these two district court, Tokyo District Court and Osaka District Court, will accumulate relevant expertise in arbitration principle and international arbitration best practices. Number three, again relating to court. Now, court may allow parties not to introduce Japanese translation of awards or exhibits in whole or part. You know, international arbitration holder documents are prepared mostly in English or other, other languages other than Japanese. And when we want to enforce it in Japan, or when we apply setting aside procedure, you have to translate every single document, which is quite costly and burdensome to the parties. But once this system will be introduced, it will be easier for the party to use Japanese court. So this is about the legal system. And I want to add the, the effort of JCAA, which is the prominent arbitration institution in Japan, which is now headed by Professor Dogauchi. So JCAA introduced three sets of arbitration rules. And the aim is to meet the global standard and go beyond. What, what does it mean by go beyond? So in addition to unsuitable model law, model, unsuitable arbitration rule and JCAA commercial arbitration rule, JCAA uh, introduced interactive arbitration rule, which is called civil law approach arbitration. In this arbitration, arbitrators are required to communicate their preliminary views on the finding of facts or application of law to the parties before the evidentiary hearing. For the, the purpose of this is to maximize the predictability and efficiency, and I understand there is already some cases um, conducted under this new rule. They also updated mediation rule. And JCA increased the transparency. Some of, may, some of, may, some of you might recall that around 2016, the ICC Arbitration Institution published, started to publish the Constitution of Tribunal. And it was a news because arbitration, you know, appreciate the confidentiality, the Constitution of Tribunal has been kept in confidence. But the quality of arbitration is defined by quality of arbitrators. So we have to know more about arbitrators and ICC started to do this. But in fact, JCAA, went even a step farther. They not only published the, um, the identity of arbitrator which had been appointed service arbitrator at the JCA, but also the number of appointments and also the languages they used. So you can get more information about the arbitrator who sat in JCA case in the past. And now JCAA is headed by a new leader, including Professor Dogauchi and new officers, not only Japanese, but non-Japanese officers, to make it easier for um, non-Japanese users to use this um, JCAA, um, JCAA um, arbitration. So to conclude, I want to raise three points as to why you have to choose arbitration in Japan. Number one, because Japan has trusted infrastructure to support international arbitration. And Japan is committed to keep upgrading infrastructure to catch up with and to be continue to be relevant to um, rapidly advancing international arbitration community. And the second reason is that because Japan is geographically conveniently located in the midst of rivalry between China and United States, we are 
just in the middle. You don't have to go down to deep south. And number three, because it is a popular destination. We, we are proud to announce that Japan, Tokyo was recognized as the, the safest city in 2019, and Japan was ranked number four as the popular destination for tourism. And um, perhaps this has to be, this has to be done in the, in the post-COVID era, but um, Japan has the most Michelin starred restaurants. So there are good reason to come to Japan. It's amazing, in fact. Tokyo is ranked as number one, and Paris is ranked number two, and Kyoto number three, and Osaka number four. So we took the first and third and fourth um, ranking of Michelin star restaurants. Now you are, I believe, convinced why you have to come to Japan to arbitrate. Thank you. Thank you, Hara Sensei. This was really the international arbitration in Japan in a nutshell, which also dealt with the recent and ongoing legislative movements. Uh, I think uh, that was informative. Okay, so far, the arbitration. The other topic is international mediation. Next and last speaker is Mr. Okada Haruo, Chief Director of the Japan International Mediation Center in Kyoto, JIMC. He is an attorney practicing in Osaka. He is also Vice President of Japan Association of Arbitrators. Mr. Okada, uh, International Ar Mediation in Japan, please. Th thank you for the kind introduction and the preparation for such interesting event. I am most honored to have an opportunity for presentation regarding the international mediation in Japan as the Kyoto Congress side event. Today, I would like to explain the latest developments in Japan for the promotion of international mediation. Move to slide six. Overview of mediation in Japan. Let me explain first, as the background information, the situation in Japan with respect to mediation in general. Because of the time constraint, another background information, part A, that is, international commercial mediation is attracting worldwide attention, is omitted. But please rest assured that you may get, see our presentation materials by visiting the Ministry of Justice's website in the near future. Next slide, seven. As explained in, oh, sorry. As explained in slide seven, Japanese culture has a high affinity with mediation and therefore Japan has a long history of domestic mediation and domestic mediation has been actively used. Slide nine, former situation of international mediation in Japan. As already explained, Japan has a culture and historical affinity with mediation, and mediation has been actively used domestically. However, until recently, international mediation has seldom been used in Japan. There are two main reasons. Reason one, obstacle one. There are several material differences in practice between global standard mediation and Japanese domestic mediation practice. Reason two, obstacle two, the mediation infrastructure in Japan was poor in terms of both hardware and software. In order to remove these two obstacles, 
Japan International Mediation Center in Kyoto, JMIC or JMC in short, was established in 2018. I will explain this development later. Next slide. Latest development for promotion of international commercial mediation in Japan. There are many latest developments for promotion of international commercial mediation in Japan, and uh, the background has already explained. Let me explain these latest developments. First, establishment and features of the JMIC, uh, November 2018. I would like to explain uh, in greater detail this development. JIMIC has removed the aforementioned obstacles. JIMIC practices global standard mediation. JIMIC is equipped with global standard hardware and software. Let me explain these points one by one. Why Kyoto? This question is often asked. Due to COVID-19, most of the today's at attendees are present not in person, but on online. We are very sorry that you couldn't come to talk Kyoto. However, we are proud to say, please visit Kyoto. You will surely enjoy the atmosphere of Kyoto with its beautiful garden, temples, shrines, etc., etc. The Pacific atmosphere of Kyoto is favorable to amicable negotiation and therefore mediation. This is the main reason why we selected Kyoto. This slide. This table shows the difference between Japanese domestic mediation practice and global standard mediation practice. JIMIC practices global standard mediation, mediator of your own choice. Confidentiality is strictly observed. Hybrid usage of facilitative type and evaluative type mediation depending upon the mediator case, etc intensive tight schedule. Joint sessions and private sessions are used as appropriate. Of course, English may be used. Mediator panel. Please note the diversity of the mediator panel of JIMIC as shown in this table. It is not an exaggeration at all that evaluation of the mediation institutions is decided mostly by the evaluation of the mediator panel. We are proud to present the fact that the mediator panel of JIMIC, along with ICC and SMC, is recognized overseas as a panel reaching diversity in the commentary of the Singapore Convention. Doshisha facilities. Thanks to the cooperation by Doshisha University, through MOU with the university, Jimmy can use the splendid state-of-the-art facilities of the university as a low cost for mediation. Please see the photos of slide 16. Beautiful, beautiful campus, academic atmosphere, and state-of-art facilities. Kodaiji Temple facilities. There is an option of mediation venue in Kodaiji Temple, which is very famous and popular among tourists. Please see the photos of Kodaiji Temple and imagine the mediation being conducted in such a picturesque and pacific place. There is another option as a mediation venue, 
of JDRC's splendid facilities situated in Tokyo and Osaka metropolitan area, as explained in Ms. Ohara Sensei's presentation. The next development in Japan, amendment to foreign registered lawyers' law in May 2020, recognition of representation of international commercial mediation by foreign lawyers and guidance foreign registered lawyers is clearly provided under a recent amendment to foreign registered lawyers' law in, two, in May 2020. This amendment will surely drive the foreign lawyers, etc., to bring their cases to the international mediation in Japan. This is also a very big movement. Third, execution and implementation of COVID-19 joint protocol between JIMC and SIMC, September 2020. JMC and SIMC signed MOU for joint protocol in September 2020 to jointly mediate online the cases relating to COVID-19 swiftly and at low cost. This is an epoch-making collaboration among international mediation institutions during and after COVID-19. Let's see a little bit more about the joint protocol. The joint protocol is a mediation jointly conducted by both organizations to resolve international commercial disputes that occur frequently due to the effects of the new coronavirus, quickly, at low cost, and online. As a general rule, the mediators, one each from GMC and SMC, will be appointed. One of them may be a SIMC mediator who understand the corporate culture of the subject foreign company and the culture of the subject foreign country and communicate English in, in, in the language of subject foreign country. And the other one of, the, one of them may be a JMIC mediator who understand the corporate culture of Japanese companies and culture of Japan and can can commun communicate in Japanese and English. Thus, it is expected that touch co-mediation may bring much smoother mediation between the parties with different cultures, languages, and other, other backgrounds. Fourth, latest movement towards early signing of Singapore Convention by Japan. Before discussing the latest movement towards early signing of Singapore Convention by Japan, I'd like to explain a little bit about the convention. Please move to back to slide five. As Professor Dogauchi explained, the Singapore Convention aims to grant international enforcement power to settlement agreements reached by international commercial mediation, similar to that of New York Convention for Arbitration. 53 countries, including the United States, China, India, Singapore, and South Korea, have signed the convention. This is a picture of the signing ceremony of the convention on, on August 7, 2019. We, members of managing committee of JMC, attended the signing ceremony. It was really a big historical event. The world has begun to move a big and steady step towards the pro-mediation. The convention entered into force in September 2020, but Japan has not yet signed the convention. Please return to slide 23 again.
In September 2020, the Minister of Justice referred the Legislative Council to consider possible amendments to the law, including enforceability of settlement agreements resulting from mediations. In October 2020, Legislative Council has been held and is expected to reach the conclusion as early as summer 2021. As explained before, mediation has a high affinity with Japanese culture, and mediation is an area where Japan can naturally contribute to the world of dispute resolution. For this purpose, I do believe it is imperative for Japan to sign the convention as early as possible. It is expected from the recent movements, as explained in this slide 23, that Japan will sign the convention in the near future. That I do hope. <laughs> Final word. Japan has a culture and history that are highly com compatible with mediation. Building on this foundation, JIMIC was established as a permanent institution to administer global standard mediation in Kyoto, the symbolic city of Japanese tradition. JIMIC has excellent hardware and software to support the mediation process in line with international standard. JIMIC offers administered mediation and ad hoc mediation services and accommodates hybrid processes that incorporate mediation and arbitration. As such, JIMIC seeks to be an attractive choice for international mediation services involving Japanese companies as well as foreign parties with no connection to Japan. We hope you will use the JIMIC mediation, visit Kyoto, and enjoy the Kyoto Pacific atmosphere. Thank you for your attendance in this event. See you soon in person in Kyoto after the, um, the end of coronavirus pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Okada-sensei, for the comprehensive introduction of the situation of international mediation in Japan and the recently launched JIMC Kyoto. Uh, thank you, speakers, for containing the speech within the time. The remaining minutes will be applied to Q&A. Uh, a couple of questions has, have already been forwarded to me. Okay, uh, the first question is uh, to Professor Dogauchi. Uh, the point you presented that arbitration and mediation fill the gap among states with respect to the spreading and enforcement of the rule of law is well taken note. That said, given that arbitration award and settlement agreement formed through mediation, ultimately need to be enforced through national judicial systems, I think uh, the questioner thinks that establishment of rule of law in each national judicial system is still important. Uh, what is your comment? Yeah, thank you. I agree with you. Uh, national uh, judicial systems uh, stability and uh, uh, security is very important uh, requirement for the development of arbitration and mediation. Uh, all uh, such uh, conclusions that uh, the arbitral awards and the, or the uh, agreement uh, through the the, as a uh, result of mediation, should be uh, recognized and enforced in the uh, legal uh, structure of the national uh, system. Uh, so I, I admit that. But uh, the, from the viewpoint of the international players, uh, the uh, individual judicial system is not enough for them. That is uh, what I tried to uh, say. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Professor Dogauchi. The next question is uh, to address to uh, Ohara Sensei. Uh, yeah, in your presentation, the recent uh, you uh, you explained about the recent legislative movement uh, in your presentation. Uh, uh, that movement is uh, from my point my my, my I mean uh, questioner's point of view uh, is generally welcome, especially. Uh, dispensing with the Japanese translation of the arbitral award and other documentary evidence in arbitration-related judicial proceedings. My question is, is, is that enough? Uh, in uh, UAE, United Arab Emirates, and China, special courts were established where the proceedings can be conducted in English not only at document level, but also uh, orally. What is your view, and the, what is your view uh, on these movements uh, and the prospect of Japan's development towards such reform? Thank you very much um, to Idei Sensei, as well as uh, a person who made this um, very pertinent question. I think, you know, I entirely agree with this questionnaire. I mean, um, the arbitration and the court system relating to arbitration has to be accessible to global user of arbitration. And to make it accessible, um, perhaps language um, is one of the biggest barrier that needs to be overcome. Um, so it's a huge step for Japanese uh, judiciary to accept um, non-Japanese documents as evidence as it is, but I do entirely agree with the question, uh, the person who raised this uh, valid question, we should, our effort shouldn't stop there. Um, we, may, we need to make it more, you know, system accessible. Just the easiest example is think about you, you yourself, Japanese, going to a country where you, you don't comprehend the language of that country. And you, you're forced to trans, you were forced to um, produce, uh, prepare every single translation of those documents. And if you have to argue, then you have to argue um, in the local language. That is a challenge. And one of the reasons why arbitration is so preferred is you can choose a language of your choice. So ultimate goal is um, the procedure, even the Japanese court procedure dedicated to arbitration I would like to see that those proceedings will be conducted in a language that is more accessible to global users, but it's a long way to go, and I appreciate the point raised by a person uh, question. Okay, thank you. Uh, as, as you know, uh, we, are, we are doing the international arbitration like this in English, but uh, as uh, Ohara Sensei said, uh, it's a huge step uh, Japanese Japanese court uh, will be conducted like th like that, but but still, uh, we shouldn't give up, and we we should uh, we should aim, aim at uh, such such state. Okay, that probably uh, the last question uh, to Okada Sensei. Uh, you mentioned uh, in your in your slide. Uh, you mentioned that traditionally mediations in Japan have been conducted on so-called evaluative method, whereas uh, U.S. and European or, or global uh, global mediations have been conducted on a facilitative method. Do you think Japanese mediation method? will be and or should be changed to change toward facilitative method or something uh, adopting uh, the element of facilitative method. What is your observation? Well, uh, you know, the I don't think that uh, which is better and which is uh, not good. You know, the there are, of course, a evaluative type and a facilitative type. But in fact, I know a very famous uh, uh, mediator 
who rather uses uh, ra uh, rather uh, uh, evaluative type mediation. So, you know, the, the, it depends upon the cases. And the point is that uh, the mediator uh, utilizes the mixture of the evaluative type of approach and uh, uh, facilitative type, or maybe use one of them depending upon the person's, uh, 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 the, the, uh, the party's uh, you know, preference, or depending upon the case. Yeah. Okay. So that, thank, you. My, uh, thank you. Thank okay. you. I understand that uh, it's not uh, it's not a simple facilitative uh, evaluative dichotomy, but uh, it it's a, it will really depend on, on the case. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, I have exhausted. Uh, uh, I think I picked up all the all the questions. Uh, okay. Uh, I believe uh, the participants' audience uh, became more familiar with the situation of international arbitration and mediation in Japan, and we realize uh, the arbitration mediation, uh, the important elements of the rule of law, especially in international setting. Okay, at the closing, I wish to remind all that exactly 10 years ago today, March 11, 2011, Japan was hit by devastating earthquake followed by tsunami and then the nuclear reactor's meltdown. I offer my deepest condolences to all who lost their lives and homes. I also wish to point out that ADRs, the topic of this session, contributed to the recovering from the disaster from 10 years ago, both earthquake itself and the nuclear reactor accident by establishing and operating, for example, bar association ADRs, as well as the Nuclear Damage Claim Dispute Resolution Center. Okay, last announcement. After this session is closed, Introductory movies for Japan International Dispute Resolution Center, Japan in, uh, International Mediation Center, Kyoto, and also Japan Commercial Arbitration Association will be shown. Many thanks to the three speakers, Professor Dogauchi, Ms. Ohara, Mr. Okada, Please give them uh, applause online and on site, please. <laughs> and and thank, uh, also thanks to the secretariat who hosted uh, this event, hosted and organized this event. With that, the session is closed. Thank you.